And that's to me what, what the most interesting innovation of all is. How to scale things in a way that's environmentally positive. Caring has embarked on a journey to create an environmental profit and loss. It began uh, both with uh, Caring and Puma with the initial environmental profit and loss, which received a lot of acclaim because it was the first time a company had publicly, one, looked at their footprint all the way back from not only their own operations, but deep in their supply chain to the raw material level, if you want, back to the planet. Mm -hmm. And two, then put a price tag on it, as if to say, if you were to write a check to nature for what you use, the ecosystem services, in the process of making your product or services, what would that check be? So that's sort of what, what the key is to, to our endeavor, is to really make that part of our business decision making. We've rolled that out across our group. And really that's something that we want to encourage all companies to do. Because you really don't understand your business from, from my perspective, you can't really understand your business until you embark on that journey and understand really what is your business made of? How does your business really run? And from where does everything come? Well, what makes it unique, there's a lot of different approaches to look at your environmental footprint. Some are mandated through different reporting standards. Uh, there's a host of them out there globally that look at traditional greenhouse gas, water, and waste. And to understand your footprint, usually it's limited to your legal boundaries to the extent of your operations because it, it mirrors your legal reporting for uh, financial purposes, your financial reporting, which has a certain scope around it. What we've done and, and, and what makes that, I think, something innovative is, one, as I said, to go through your entire supply chain. So you want to look at um, each step, each tier in your supply chain, uh, if you will, to tier four, which is the raw material level. So it's really understanding where things are made, how they're made, by whom. That's the first bit. So it's a, a bigger view of your footprint. And it's also including beyond uh, water waste and greenhouse gas, uh, water pollution, air pollution, land use. And within land use is incorporated um, biodiversity as well. So it's a broader scope of looking at your footprint, but then monetizing it, which is assigning sort of a monetary value to it, really is, I think, um, a breakthrough in that it helps compare your impacts, not only across different business processes, different product categories, different business units, but then also within an industry and beyond the industry. So I think a few things. One, investors are really important. I think investors understand that with natural capital accounting and with EP&L, we can identify resource scarcity and we can make better decisions that actually prevent that resource scarcity from impacting the business. So if I make a product out of a particular material that's not going to be available and I can source from a better location and lock into that sourcing and, and build those relationships with that particular part of that supplier or supply chain, or even within an agricultural system there that needs more support. I've not only guaranteed revenue, but I found a way to manage cost because when resource becomes scarce, prices go up. Mm. So from an investor standpoint, there's huge value here. And it eliminates a lot of the risk in terms of the business risk overall, the company, in terms of environmental shocks. Mm. So the investor community, I think, can benefit greatly from um, natural capital accounting. Mm. And I think for business decision makers, even if you don't use it as a reporting tool externally, internally, you better know that stuff. Mm. Because the product you make today, you may not be able to make tomorrow. Well, I think there's, there's, there's a way to look at our targets from, from the perspective is some are, we look at water waste and greenhouse gas and a 25% mm. reduction, and we're looking at that across the supply chain. Mm. So that's like the EPNL thinking is embedded in that. Mm. That's a very ambitious target because we're not just, we're going beyond, again, our legal boundaries into yeah. Yeah. our supply chain. Yeah. We also have some um, uh, targets uh, that complement those around sourcing, uh, around leather, um, gold, diamonds, 
uh, precious skins and mm. furs in terms of the sustainability in which and, and how they're produced or, mm. or how they're um, the systems that's producing mm. them mm. to ensure they're verifiable and sustainable. Mm. So it's in, in that way it's very very ambitious because we're really in essence trying to to do things in a way that don't um, result in degradation of uh, of ecosystem services and that do not negatively impact biodiversity mm -hmm. at a minimum and really looking at ways to positively impact and to rebuild um, on the flip side. The support we've had with EPNL from all our brands and it's been very much a collaborative process because we took the methodology from very initial stages from Puma, sort of a proof of concept pilot, mm. which is very, very well received. So we've had an opportunity to do a lot of things collaboratively with our brand, make it real to their business and their business decisions, and to identify opportunities for them that really can make a difference in terms of our, our impact and spur innovation, whether it's new materials, um, new ways of sourcing, uh, new processes, new technologies. That's what I think is really, really interesting. It's not the EPNL as a methodology, not um, how you do it, but what you can do with it. And that's the exciting part for us. Just two reasons. One, because you, you may see, see things in your business that you don't expect. Not all of them are negative. For instance, we saw metals that we use in our business, not something we, a big part of our business, nor something we considered, considered strategic per se, had a significant impact because the metal, metallurgy process, um, the metal refining process has, um, the water pollution is, is significant on that. So it takes courage to look sort of within yourself as an enterprise to see what you do and what the impacts are. I think it takes a lot of courage to publicly talk about that. And that's what we've committed to do with our, our target to uh, uh, publish our EPNL. That's what we initially did um, with Puma, and that's where I think it, it does take courage to go out there and not only say, we're doing this, but to talk about what you're doing and what it means. The innovation we're wishing for and we're really looking for is a truly positive, um, I'd call it a net positive from an EP&L perspective uh, product that actually generates more ecosystem services, actually helps biodiversity, actually, in a sense, gives back more than it takes. Mm. And that's, at first, that seemed like a theoretical concept for us. Now um, we're seeing more and more possibilities of how we can make that happen.